So Don and I uh, took a look at this project and discussed it yesterday. Um, the hearing process tonight, this could get kind of long, so I want to get through it as, uh, as smoothly as possible. Uh, the applicant, PG&E, will have up to 30 minutes to talk about this. Uh, they don't need to use that all if they don't need to, uh, but it is a 240-page application. Then they'll be followed by a staff presentation by uh, uh, Don and myself. And I think we can do that in about 15 minutes. The public comments, the council will follow that. Uh, each member of the public is welcome to comment for up to three minutes on this project. Uh, and uh, it's at the discretion of the chair as if you want to go longer than that. Uh, then we'll have the council submitting questions uh, to the applicant or the public. And finally, we'll move on to council deliberation. So right now, screen's working here. We'll go to the PG&E presentation with Mr. VSAR. Um, and I'll stop sharing my screen for the moment. Mr. VSAR, I don't know if you uh, have visual capabilities tonight or you're just calling in. Hello, everybody. Um, unfortunately, the, our pg and &E company actually um, prohibits the use of Zoom. And so I'm using my personal computer and I don't have access to share screens. Um, but I can go over a general um, idea of what this project entails um, and just talk at kind of a high level of what we're trying to accomplish and as well as any of the environmental items that, that we have. Um, so it's okay with this um, board. I'll go ahead and move forward and just briefly talk about the project. Um, as Tom, you mentioned, this is a 28 linear mile stretch of our Elk Wallala 60 kilovolt power line. Um, it is a transmission line, so it's not part of the, the distribution line. Um, it extends from Elk to Gualala um, in Mendocino County. And um, it's within the, the Mendocino County LCP, the local coastal program. And it's also within PG&E's multi-region operations and maintenance habitat conservation plan, or as we refer to it as the multi-region HCP, um, which is a U.S. Fish and Wildlife 30-year permit we've obtained um, for our environmental and maintenance work throughout um, the service territory of California. So uh, what this work is, it's called, we refer to it as TVMR, which is the Transmission Vegetation Management Reliability. Um, so it includes vegetation um, work along our, our electric transmission corridor. Um, it includes removal and pruning of trees and brush um, as needed that are directly under or adjacent to the electrical lines. Um, these units oftentimes can cause power outages and um, fires if they come into contact with the lines. And therefore, um, as mandated by the California Public Utility Commission, pg e must perform ongoing vegetation management of all its overhead electric distribution and transmission facilities um, in compliance with several rules and regulations. The clearance regulations um, are typically for 60 kilovolt lines is 12 feet. However, um, we oftentimes clear below, um, we clear beyond these distances to account for growth of the facilities um, and just maintain safety and reliability so that there's no power outages along the transmission line. Um, so as part of this work, there's going to be no subsurface disturbance. Um, so no ground disturbance will occur. Um, the vegetation management activities are categorized as our routine um, right-of-way clearing um, to protect our assets from um, any kind of outage that is vegetation caused. Um, and then where we will be removing trees and vegetation, we plan to have chippers um, available um, so that we can take the material, um, either dispose of it or um, scatter it within the area if it's not close to our chipper locations. Um, and those areas that we plan to do that are um, not to exceed 18 inches above ground. Um, of course, we instruct crews to remain vehicles on roads. Um, anywhere that they plan to do any vegetation management activities that are off-road um, have to be done by foot. And they are going to be using hand tools to um, do the tree trimming and vegetation uh, removal. Um, so in addition to the um, equipment that we will be using, we plan to use herbicides on units that are known to regrow and um, therefore rejoin the um, potential compliance issues um, of our line. Um, and all the herbicides we use are registered by the State Department of Pesticide Regulations and approved for use by um, the EPA. 
Um, and so PGE uses aquatically labeled compounds when working within riparian zones or near waters and wetlands. And in addition to that, as part of our multi-region HCP, we do provide best management practices um, to our crews to make sure that we are in compliance with the use of those um, herbicides and pesticides um, so that they are not impacting any water features. Um, as I move into the archeological portion of this project, um, we did find that there are three culturally sensitive areas, um, but because there's no ground disturbance as proposed as part of this work, we um, are not anticipating any um, disturbances there. Um, as far as the biological component goes uh, forward, our multi-region habitat conservation plan lists several BMPs um, that we are planning to implement to minimize impacts to any of the, the species that um, wildlife are out there. And um, there is a silver spot butterfly that pg &E plans to do um, biological surveys where there are known occurrences for those host plants. And um, those will be scheduled and the data will come back to our team. We will assess and have the crews move forward once we have the opportunity to flag those host plants for avoidances. Um, and then there is a part of this project that does cross Highway 1 at uh, multiple lo locations. And um, we know that Highway 1 is considered a scenic highway. And we are working with the California Department um, of Transportation on obtaining permits in order to do that work within their right of way. And um, with that said, I believe that's kind of a brief summary of the project. I know I didn't use the, the full 30 minutes allotted, but um, I'll pass it back to the board here um, for any um, additional information or, or questions that arise. Thank you, Mr. Villasenor. And um, now we'll move into the presentation that Don and I assembled from our information. Uh, does everybody see that screen now? Yes. You see yeah, yes. 2021? Okay. Yes. So uh, as Mr. Villasenor suggested this is um, this is the project description here's a map of it uh, for those of you who have a computer in front of you and it does comply with uh, existing state and federal laws and regulations to maintain required clearances mandated by the PUC um, let me go on to my next slide uh, the application uh, specifically uh, cites the codes that are used in uh, to require this, including the Public Resources Code 4293, CPUC General Order 95, Rule 35, and um, another uh, Energy Commission's FAC 030102. Uh, these regulations identify specific clearances. I believe these were done as uh, minimums. Uh, and as Mr. Villasenor explained, uh, PG&E may clear beyond these distances to account for in growth and maintain facility safety and reliability. Um, now, down at the bottom of the screen, you'll notice there's also a, a you mentioned that if chippers uh, will be used for debris when possible, if they can be brought within 100 feet of the work site, otherwise debris will be lopped and scattered not to exceed in, in 18 inches above the ground, which is permissible under the PUC uh, requirements. Uh, but one of the things Don and I looked at. Uh, another publication from PG&E, PG&E Currents in November 2017, went into a little bit more depth about these rules. Um, and General Order 95, Rule 35, also requires the removal of dead, diseased, defective, and dying trees that could fall into the lines. Uh, so if there's a dead tree near the lines, even if it's out of the right of way, they may want to uh, get on that. Um, the Public Resource Code 4292, um, which is administered by the California Department of Forestry, uh, talks about lengths within a 10 foot radius of the pole to be removed. Um, but it says also says all dead branches below the cross arms and within 10 feet of the radius must be removed. Uh, PRC 4293 also requires, well, that's four feet clearance for less voltage. Uh, and the General Order 9535, also requires removal of dead, diseased, defective, and dying trees. I mentioned that earlier. Here's the actual PUC rule. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I am a writer by profession. And I did notice in here that there is some conditional language uh, 
in the, about the middle of the screen, you'll see a sentence that says each utility may determine and apply additional appropriate clearances beyond the clearances listed below, which take into consideration various factors. And it lists about 12 factors down here. Uh, including things like vegetation, growth rate, and experience of particular species and um, uh, location of the vegetation and things like that. But 12 feet is the restriction that's set as a minimum by the PUC. Uh, Mr. Junker, this is, uh, you'll be familiar with this view. This is the power station in Wallala that we talked about last month at CDP 2021-0009. And Mr. Junker's property is uh, begins where this ends, about uh, right with that line of trees. It's interesting in this case, and the only reason I included this slide tonight is because uh, of those conditional phrases. In this case, PG&E uh, sought permission from Mr. Bauer to cut the trees on the north side and obtained it. However, it was unable to obtain permission from Mr. Junker on the south side. And so it left those trees and is continuing, I think, to speak with them about that. These trees obviously are um, hanging right over the substation. And um, there is discretion for the home, for the property owner to negotiate with PGE about that. When I posted this uh, announcement of the meeting on Facebook, uh, there were a number of additional safety concerns and questions raised by the public. And all we received 40, 57 comments the last time I looked. Um, and there was broad agreement. I think everybody on the chain agreed that trimming is necessary to reduce fire danger, especially in this crazy year. And everybody seems to be aware uh, that falling lines have caused fires. But there were a lot of questions about practices, employed and alternatives. And I just wanted to put up a, a representation of some of those. Um, this is not all of them. There were some extreme comments. Uh, people who just don't like PG&E, or perhaps they don't like anybody who questions whether or not a tree should be cut down. Uh, I left those out in favor of the more substantive uh, comments. Uh, Ms. Shattuck, who is with us tonight, I'm glad to see her here. Um, she'll be a part of this discussion, I think. She's from Fort Bragg. And Fort Bragg isn't even part of this project, but she is involved in another leg of this project from Fort Bragg down to Elk uh, and has had some problems uh, that I think may be instructive to people down here on the Elk to Wallala end of this project. Uh, she said pg and &E contractors were marking shorter redwood trees and trees more than 100 feet from the lines, saying the trees could fall and grow and fall onto the lines, creating a, a large swath across her property much larger than the ROW. Now, I want to note immediately that the Shattuck called me today and told me that she's met this morning with neighbors, uh, PG&E officials, and the contractor, and happily they worked out agreements where they will seek permission before cutting down any of those trees. But I'm going to show you a few pictures in a minute and explain, come back to Jenny. Um, a number of people talked about the slash below the trees, um, not just the average of 18 inches of debris that falls from cutting branches, but logs and uh, trees and trunks, uh, all sorts of things uh, that are gathering under the power lines. Uh, I myself am wondering about the slash uh, 18 inches deep of pine branches dried out in the sun under a power line doesn't sound like a real good idea to me. And we'll talk about that in our discussion later on. Um, Ms. Kirchner raised a question about pesticides. I think uh, our Kirchner is with us tonight. She can comment in the public comment period. Several people raised questions about uh, can we underground the cables or, and I pointed out in the discussion on the Facebook page that pg &E actually has plans to underground 10,000 uh, miles of cables. I think I'm getting that right. Um, but that probably won't happen during the current fire season. And this is, this is now, and that would be then. Um, there were also a little discussion about alternatives to having power grids like this and planning for the future instead of sustaining a system from the past. And uh, there was also a question about, uh, will they obtain my permission if they go outside the ROW, the right of way, uh, which I think is a great question. And as you saw at Walala, at the power station, they did. Um, and we'll talk about that. 
This, I'm going to show a few pictures from uh, Ms. Shattuck provided to me the other day. Uh, she called me up and uh, we had quite a talk and she gave me about 30 pictures. I'm only going to show a few of them. Uh, this is a typical section of the power line cutting through her property down the hill. You can see the right of way is very clear. What you don't see in this photo, though, is that virtually all the trees on both sides of this right of way are marked for uh, reduction. And that's why Ms. Shattuck and some of her neighbors got together with BG&E today to say, what are you doing? Uh, why are you marking all these trees for cutting down? They're healthy trees. They're not within the power line. They're well, way more than 12 feet away. What's going on here? Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Here's another shot from her land. This is her driveway. Again, you see the power lines cutting through there. You see trees up on the hillside, healthy trees. Uh, there are some firs and some redwoods in this photo. Uh, well more than, these are probably 50, 70 feet away from the power line, uh, but they're growing tall and they were also marked for removal. Here's another shot of her driveway with smaller trees along. This is a, uh, uh, for Mr. Vias and your sake, this is a straight view of the driveway looking straight ahead with power lines directly overhead and trees on both sides. These are shorter trees, all marked for removal. And finally, uh, there's a photo of another right-of-way section where there's a fairly heavy growth on the ground. Uh, I would say it's probably doesn't get more than three feet high and a row of trees on the far side. And again, this row of trees, uh, which is far away from the power lines, um, are marked for removal or were marked for removal uh, until today's conversation, I guess. So this is a photo I've taken of uh, Old Stage Road in Malala. Uh, this is a typical section of what the power lines look like as they cross through Malala on the ridge, going down to our power station next to Mr. Junker's property. Uh, you'll see that the power lines here, it's a little hard to tell exactly how far they are from the trees, but you can easily imagine a branch getting blown onto the power lines. And I would imagine that those were the kind of branches that PG&E is out to, to trim. Um, what I don't know after speaking to uh, Jenny is whether they plan to take some of these trees that are nearby because they pose a risk of falling on the lines, uh, whether they would talk to the property owner about reducing trees or taking trees, um, how those will be marked and how the property owners will be notified about those trees. I think everybody's interested in the fire safety, as we noted earlier. Uh, I think a lot of people who live up on the ridge, however, would be surprised if the row of trees in front of their house were suddenly gone or were cut in. So I want to get into that discussion tonight so that people know what to expect. There are two more shots of the power line up on Old Stage Road. Again, you can, it's a little hard to judge exactly how far the lines are from the trees, but you can easily see that there's room to trim some of these trees. Uh, and in this case, on the, on the photo on the left, uh, I'm showing a photo near the intersection of Packwoods Road and Old Stage Road. And the power lines appear to be well over the fence line on the foreground, um, which makes me question exactly where this right of way is. It is the fence in the right of way or are the power lines leaning over the fence? And what's the situation there? That's a local property owner situation, and I'll let the property owner talk to PG&E about it. But again, if PG&E were to take out those trees, I could imagine the property owner might be coming back to GMAC and saying, what happened here? And I'm trying to get my computer to respond. And it is not. Okay. So that concludes my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing now. The next part of the program would be public comments. And uh, I've had everybody on mood and uh, mute. <laughs> and uh, if you know how to use uh, Zoom and want to raise your hand, you can do that. Or I can just start calling on people I know who are here to comment, uh, starting with, I think, Jenny Shattuck. Um, let me make sure she's unmuted first. Can you Jenny, hear me? Are, yeah, we can hear you fine. Go ahead, Jenny. You have uh, you have three minutes, but take your time and go for it. Okay. 
Okay. I actually wrote an email because I don't know if I'll lose you where I'm at. So if I do, you can read my email. Um, I would advise any property owner to not give permission to expand their right of way. What we were told today was all of the trees were marked because they would like to expand their right of way an additional 30 feet in each direction beyond the easement that they already have. Um, and uh, they wouldn't purchase this easement, but they were hoping property owners would just give it to them. Um, I should have asked, um, and I forgot, so maybe if PG is still on the line, maybe they could follow up. If allowing a few of what they can, not just trees to expand the line, but there's different marks, some say PS for the public safety. Um, if allowing a few of those trees to be cut because um, potentially they could be hazardous, um, like in the past, pg e topped a tree, and now it has a fork at the top, so maybe one could split off. Um, but I'm wondering if um, giving permission to go outside the easement is actually giving them permanent permission to expand the easement um, for taking a few of those trees that are outside the easement. Um, and I forgot to ask that today. So... Um, I would just advise that property owners um, actually have somebody from pg e and go through tree by tree, which is what we did today. Um, many that we had an arborist and um, Jim Bell from pg e Brian Campbell from pg e and I don't know the other guy's name. And a lot of the trees that were marked, I said, how can these be hazardous? And they said, they're not. It's just that our computer system from our satellite, the algorithms say they're hazardous because from satellite, they look dangerous. Um, so that's what all those trees were marked on the driveway on that section of the property. Um, and I think they, we agreed like one or two of them could be hazardous potentially and we would be okay with that there were some where some trees were growing out of the side of the stump um, at an angle towards the power lines even though they were it would probably take 15 20 years for them to get big enough to maybe fall into the power lines like there's a couple like that we weren't too worried about but our straight healthy trees we definitely don't want removed this is our long time investment to manage our property um I think just having people talk to pg e because there are multiple subcontractors that went through and marked different things. And we've had some subcontractors show up. I guess they use the same color paint um, and misidentify their own markings and remove trees. The neighbor had trees cut 150 to 300 feet outside the easement. Those trees are all over the place still. And actually, they had a follow up meeting at that property that was a neighboring property Jenny, today. Um, Jenny, it, you're, you're, yeah. about, you're a little over three minutes. Uh, can I ask you okay. to wrap up unless well, the chairman wants to give you more time? Um, that's all I have to say. I'm just wishing you luck and hoping that property owners really get involved and ask questions for clarification. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Jenny. I appreciate that. And we may come back to you in questions. Uh, okay. Mr. Junker, you've been waiting a month to talk to us. Would you like to say something? I think you're on mute and would have to take yourself off. Can you hear me you now? Me? Yes, we can, sir. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the problem I have is they want to take down, I think, 16 trees on my side of the property. And those are the only thing that protect me from this Pacific Gas and Electric uh, Station. The noise is every year is just getting louder and louder. It's just making it unbearable uh, in my house. Plus, the, if you came up and looked at that grove of redwoods, they're a beautiful grove. And... There's a lot of sentimental value because I also, uh, that's where the ashes from my mother and dad are in those groves of redwoods. If you saw them, they're very beautiful. They're really not bothering the, the substation any more than uh, 
anything else. And three years ago, a guy from the, the, that does the right away from the power line, he was over here. I talked with him and he said everything was okay for the power line. And that's uh, my comment on the trees. Thank you, Mr. Junker. Uh, we may come back to you during questions. Uh, please uh, stay with us tonight. Um, next speaker, okay, Ms. Kirchner. Uh, are you still with us tonight? Yes, you are. You'll need to unmute. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. I have a little bit of a lag. So um, <sighs> greetings, everyone. So yeah, I'm a property owner here along the power lines on 10 mile and point arena. And um, looking at the maps and reading the proposal, I have some concerns about the uh, language around the 12 foot right of way easement and how it may get larger or smaller or change and then hearing from the other property owners and their experiences. Um, I would like to know who we need to talk to to make an appointment with someone like a human in real time to be able to look at the property and see what is what. I do a pretty good job of maintaining already and so I just want to verify that that's all good. And um, I have concerns about the pesticide herbicide use. Um, I've talked to multiple property owners here in the area and there's a resounding no for that. And so I would like to request an opt out option for property owners um, and that we can look at that and implement that and look at how that affects things. I mean, again, I'm a pretty hardy individual. I already maintain a pretty clear line and I know that others are willing to as well. And so I'd like that to be an option. I think it's very important for us not to clog our waterways, our wells, our springs. Galloway Creek runs through my land. And so it's very important to me to steward it to the best of my ability uh, and keep it in its natural state. So yeah, I would love some information who to talk to about the tree situation. I also had a similar experience the last time the pg e folks were out, they were um, trimming and cutting trees that were in the algorithm for, but they were absolutely not in the way of anything. So that and hearing other people's experiences that um, causes concern. So I would love to learn about that more and see who to talk to about that. Thank you. And um, Joni Goshorn, I see you here. Did you want to comment? Yeah, hi, Tom. Um, I'm here with Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So I agree very much so with Erin. Um, we are pretty strongly about the um, herbicides. Very much concerned about our water, which is already, you know, in drought conditions. Um, I'm mainly here to hear about the process. As you know, I'm not an actual property owner, although I live very close to one of the proposed um, lines here in Point Arena. And um, my personal experience isn't even here. It's at a previous uh, property in Petaluma. But my concern with a lot of the people who do the work with pg and &E is their background and their training. And one of the gentlemen who was doing just some of the surveying, you know, his previous job was at Starbucks. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it does concern me. Uh, I've seen a lot of hack jobs with the, with the tree trimming that um, are aesthetically unappealing. So that's what I have to say. Tom, um, I'm not hearing you. Okay, I see a couple more names uh, on our roster tonight who are here, Jackie Dixon and Tara Jackson. If either of you would like to comment on this, I don't know if you're here for this item or something else. 
Hi, this is Tara Jackson. I'm actually, um, I'm with Wind Coastal Planning and Biology. I'm agent for the applicant Wahlberg. Good, thank you. And Jackie Dixon, are you here for a particular item tonight? Hi, I'm here with Wind Coastal Planning and Biology as well, um, but okay. I am just here to observe. Okay, great. So I think that concludes, unless there's anybody else who wants to make themselves known to comment on this item, I think that concludes our public comment period. Okay. Um, I wanted to say something. Um, who's that? Kirk. Kirk wanted to say something about this, this project. Oh, sure. Kirk, uh, Kirk Mobert. Uh, actually, I, I heard all of my concerns already expressed. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that you have an algorithm picking out where to cut. Uh, and I'm also concerned uh, about the spraying. Um, you know, I mean, I think we've learned a long time ago that, you know, that stuff flows downstream uh, and it never works out. And, so, and, and I hear that this has been, you know, approved for use by federal agencies, but they have been in the past. Uh, haven't we learned anything yet? I guess that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you. Good night. Thank you, Kirk. Um, I also wanted to um, ask how the herbicides would be uh, sprayed uh, and or um, physically put onto the land. But more than that, what herbicides would be used? Um, I know they're quote approved, unquote. But, um, you know, everything goes downhill, you know, and, and uh, uh, things that uh, uh, hunt bugs uh, like birds, uh, all of the, uh, all of the buildup in the system uh, that kills a bird can then start building up in a system that uh, like a skunk or a, a, a possum or whatever comes in and eats the bird. Uh, or several birds, and it, it just goes on and on and on. And uh, I just want to know what pesticides and uh, what the repercussions on, on the natural environment and uh, the habitat and those who live in that habitat, what's going to happen uh, uh, with it. I'm, I'm very concerned with it. And that's all that I had to ask at how they were going to do it. I understand that they could apply it via truck. I, I also understand they could apply it with one gentleman uh, or a woman um, spraying it with a backpack of, of, of uh, whatever herbicide they're using. So I don't know how that's going to be done and what areas. And also I understand that they have to um, uh, tell people uh, and notify them that they're going to spray on their land. How much notification do they get and how are they notified? By mail or is it going to be posted on their property? And if so, could can it, the posting be seen by uh, the public? Um, I don't know. And uh, that's also a concern. Uh, if it's going to be by mail in 24 hours, uh, good luck. They aren't going to know until it's over. Okay, um, I think that concludes our public comment period. I'm gonna go back to Mr. Villasenor. Um, since we've had so many direct questions already, rather than have the council repeat them, I thought maybe he would wanna clarify at this point some of these, uh, some of these points. Absolutely, um, I'd be happy to do so. And Tom, please let me know um, if there's a time limit that um, I'm going over, um, but I will get started with the herbicide. You're um, fine. Uh, you, you only took about five minutes for your presentation, so you could go on for quite a while here if you want. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll kind of um, introduce myself, which I should have done in the beginning. Um, my name is Robert Villasenor. I'm a pg and &E environmental planner, um, and so I work on the environmental side of things with the biological components and the um, archaeological components. And so I can speak to the herbicide. Um, Mary, I know you mentioned you were interested in hearing how we apply um, the herbicide. So as part of this project, um, there will be no truck that will be applying herbicide. Um, the, all herbicide usage will be done by hand. Um, this is done by a small handheld spray bottle or a four gallon backpack, like you mentioned, 
um, with a wand applicator and a hand pump to pressurize the liquids. Um, those herbicides are used to uh, cut stump applications. So once the trees are cut, they're applied directly to the stumps. Um, and then they are only applied to um, species that are known to vigorously re-sprout when cut. Um, and again, they're applied directly to the cut stump or on larger stumps to the outer ring to encompass um, those layers so that there's, there's no regrowth there. Um, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, PG&E does have best management practices as part of the um, US Fish and Wildlife permit um, that we instill. And I can go through some of these um, with this um, quorum here. And so we have several BMPs. Um, the first one, they are actually 28 through 35 that we instruct crews to use. Um, so for BMP number 28, which is specifically called out in the permit, um, a licensed pest control advisor must write prescriptions for all herbicide and tree growth regulator applications. Contractors must use that qualified applicator when applying herbicide and tree growth regulations for vegetation management. Uh, for BMP 29, the nozzle tip pressure and sprayer configurations should be such to produce a coarser droplet to minimize drift. And so we obviously don't want the wind to pick up the herbicide and take it elsewhere. Um, for BMP 30, pesticides must not be transported in the same compartment with persons, food, or feed. Pesticide containers must be secured to the vehicle during transportation in a manner that will prevent spilling into or off the vehicle. Um, so we just wanna make sure that, that those pesticides and herbicides are secure when traveling to and from work locations. For BMP 31, selective application techniques should be used for v vegetation management, right-of-way maintenance operations wherever applicable so that the desir desirable vegetation is not adversely affected. Um, for BMP 32, the contractor must have a written training program for employees who handle pesticides. The written program must describe the materials and the information that will be provided and used to train the employees. So everybody that is touching these herbicides and applying them have to go through training in order to use those products um, within the vegetation uh, scope. For BMP 33, um, trainings must be completed before an employee is allowed to handle the pesticide um, and must be continually updated to cover any new pesticides that will be handled. Training must be repeated at least annually thereafter. For BMP 34, these special precautions must be observed during periods of inclement weather um, applications must not be made in immediately prior to or immediately following rain when runoff could be expected. Applications must not be made when wind and or fog conditions have the potential to cause drift. Um, and then basal bark applications must not be made when stems are wet with rain, snow, or ice. And so we further want to eliminate um, the spread of the herbicide where it, it should not go. And then um, for BMP 35, we have a, a chart, um, which you can see in the, the US Fish and Wildlife um, permit. Um, and there's a chart listed there for when uh, herbicide is approved for use specifically within aquatic resources. Um, so within 25 feet, it's not approved for aquatic use. And then you have the crews have to be within 200, outside of 200 feet when mixing, loading or cleaning um, those products. Um, so that kind of wraps up the, the herbicide component. I know there was some more questions that came up about um, the right-of-way clearing. And um, I think there was a question that came up on easements. And so a lot, of, um, I, a lot of times when the easements are discussed, there's a clause, we call it the secondary clause, where it allows PG&E to um, maintain the vegetation along its transmission and distribution lines. And um, a lot of times it will say that pg &E has the right to trim and remove vegetation along and adjacent to um, the facilities. So while we might have a 60 foot strip, um, for example, um, that's not necessarily the case. And for this transmission line, it's just an example. Uh, we potentially would have the capability to um, trim or remove vegetation outside of that right away as specifically stated in the easement. So if, if you do, own property out here with a, a transmission line on it, um, it will be called out in the easement. And um, I would encourage you to, to find that document and to pull it up um, and to, to look over it there. Um, folks from pg &E should be in contact with you um, about the work. If there is anything, any questions that come up, um, you should have received a letter 
um, stating that this work will be coming up. Um, and if you have not received that letter and you have questions, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, I could post my email address here um, in a chat function. Um, and that way it's visible to those property owners that, that have questions. And of course, I would most likely pass your information along to one of our um, vegetation management folks like Brian Campbell, um, who met with Jenny out in the field um, to kind of meet with you in person and go over the scope of work specifically for your property and help you identify why those trees have been targeted. And then I know there were some more questions that came up about um, work scope and how we're identifying trees. And unfortunately, I, um, I don't have any other colleagues from vegetation management on the phone with me to answer specifically how we identify those trees. Um, I know that we mitigate um, power outages for trees that are oftentimes falling into um, electric facilities that you know, could cause wildfires and or power outages. Um, and it's not only the, falling, the felling of the trees um, it's also um, potential wind events that could um, push these vegetation units into the power lines and, and cause those um, hazards. And so that's also considered as part of the scope um, for the transmission right of way projects. And I see, Mary, you got your hand up. Uh, yes. Um yeah, let's, let's move into the, uh, the council questions now. Mary, uh, you can ask questions first. Go ahead. Oh, um, how far will the pesticides be carried, uh, the pesticide residue be carried in the air, uh, say, after it's been sprayed and um, <clears throat> if it's windy, because we have children who are picked up all along these roads by the school bus, and um, uh, this could prove hazardous towards them, and I'm concerned about their health. Absolutely. Thanks, Mary, for the question. So we have our crew members apply the herbicide directly to the stumps, so that way there is no carrying or transmission of the herbicide um, to other locations. We strictly prohibit our crews to apply herbicide during strong wind events. Um, that way it also reduces um, the chance of the wind um, carrying those substances um, into the air and further into areas that we don't want the herbicides to be applied. So it won't affect children standing by the roadside, say five feet from a tree that's been cut or three feet from a tree that's been cut. Correct. We have the crews use um, a drip method uh, for the herbicide uh, on the outer layer. And so um, there shouldn't be any airborne herbicide that um, is expelled from the equipment. Okay. Um, let's go to another council member. Uh, Melissa, do you have any questions uh, at this point? Melissa, you're still on mute. Well, we can't hear Melissa. Let's go to uh, let's go to our new member, Kevin Evans. Uh, Kevin, you've heard this discussion. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Tom. Um, yes, I do have some questions for uh, Robert. Um, you talked about the application of herbicides and pesticides. Um, is there a practice to notify the property owners prior to the application of, of those herbicides and pesticides? That's a good question, Evan. I'm honestly not sure if those are communicated. I believe that um, in the letter that is received, it should specify what those parameters of the scope of work will be. Um, I know generally if there is a a species of tree that is known to re-sprout quickly um, that could potentially be hazardous, they will apply herbicide. And so the chances of herbicide usage occurring are very likely, but um, that should be, there should be some communication going out to each property owner about the work taking place on their specific parcel. Yeah, I definitely think that the property owner should be notified before any application. How about to the public uh, in general, will you be posting signs along the right-of-way 
uh, where there may be public traffic, people walking their dogs, or even even walk, you know, taking hikes themselves, notifying them of a spraying period. Um, that is also a good question. Um, I know we're posting signs about work happening as part of the coastal development permit process. Um, I don't believe that encompasses the herbicide usage. I think um, in order for folks to find out that we're doing that, um, they'd have to go onto the um, permit application that is listed in that posting and to find out more about the scope. Okay, is, is there any way that we can get a list of those pesticides and herbicides that you're planning on using? So if any of the council members are asked, we can be better informed on that? Sure, I can make that request over to our licensed pest control advisor and um, get a list of what we typically use in this vicinity. Okay, and, and my last question is, I know you were talking about the use of chainsaws and other equipment. What are, we, what are your hours of operation? So our hours of operation should typically be from, I, I believe the crews start showing up around 7 a.m. Um, to get ready, start their tailboards, go over um, safety items as well as biological and archaeological components. Um, and then they should be getting started around 8 a.m. And I believe the work should cease around 5 p.m. Um, like a, a typical work day. And will they be um, doing traffic control? Yes, absolutely. In places where um, the roads will be um, nearby or if there's a trail nearby, there will be signs posted um, and traffic control will definitely be placed with um, a flagger if necessary or um, any other signage that is required. And I guess my one last question, um, I guess it's an environmental component. Will there be any testing of the water downstream after application? Um, I don't believe we currently have um, a, um, uh, an item set up to test the water downstream because we do have measures in place to prevent any kind of um, impacts to any of those um, channels, those bed banging channels, those creeks, those water features. Um, and so we have avoidance and minimization measures to ensure that doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, Robert, do you have any questions? Yes, I do um, have a couple of questions for Robert. Um, I'm, I'm, curious, Hello? I'm curious as to when the last time um, this kind of uh, vegetation management maintenance um, program, when, when this was last done in the right of way of pg &E up on the ridge. Robert, that's a great question, and you got a great name. Um, I, I'm not sure of any vegetation management right-of-way clearing um, happening in this area. I'm sure that we did, um, because I can see from the aerial that this area does look a little bit um, cleared um, from an aerial point of view. Um, I'd have to look into the records to see um, what was cleared here in the past. Um, I could check with my colleague Brittany's records just to, to see um, when that was last done. I will bring up another item that kind of will touch on this. Um, as part of this transmission vegetation management reliability project, we will likely do another five, in five years, we will do a, a maintenance, um, which is very similar. A lot of the times it's mostly brush that is captured. Um, we will do um, vegetation removal of brush that has re-sprouted um, just from the five years or so um, that has occurred. And so that's kind of the maintenance plan moving forward every five years there will be a similar project like this. So my follow-up question to that is, why do we even need to apply pesticides or herbicides if one is going to be going through there again in a few years and, and, and um, removing this vegetation that has grown up in a short period of time and it won't be, won't, probably won't be that hard to manage? That's a good question. Um, so we have, um, this vegetation management project is happening and they will be applying herbicide but there will be um, invasive species that will oftentimes pop up. And while we do have a routine team that will come through every year or two and conduct routine maintenance work, um, we, we are expecting to see, um, and I guess to, to kind of reemphasize that, our routine folks focus on the line clearances, um, which are you know 12 feet radial around the line. And so they're not necessarily targeting the brush that will pop up. Um, so our 
our five-year maintenance plan will capture those brush units that are growing under the line that um, are mostly causing a fire hazard. If there were to be a spark, um, it could potentially ignite those brush units. And so we are expecting there to be brush regrowth, not from just the herbicide application that's occurring with this project, but just over time for new vegetation to occur. Um, and then as part of that maintenance project, there will be more herbicide usage that will um, be applied to that five-year program every five years. Um, yeah, it's just a shame that we even have to use the, uh, the herbicides and, and, and herbicides uh, um, when we're going through these areas anyway. I've um, been up here for 35 years and I've sold a lot of property that are along these easements and growths. Um, and I've seen over the years that there has been some maintenance, um, but it doesn't seem like uh, enough has been done over all the years. And I, I just don't feel that we need to do all this um, whole in, in, invasive type of um, rigorous type of um, herbicide uh, application when we could really be going through and just maintaining it regularly and um, not having to, uh, it, it seems like wherever we as mankind uh, become too involved with nature, um, that's where the invasive type of uh, um, species come, come in. And um, if we could just restrict it to uh, reducing the, 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 the brush and, and the things that grow up in pg and right away, we'd be better off. Understood. I made a note here to take that back to my team. Okay, thanks, Robert. Is that it, uh, Robert? That's it for me. Okay, Don Hess. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say that uh, I think this work is very. Can you hear me? Uh, we 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 asked called you, Melissa. We'll come back to you right after Don. I keep on muting and getting ignored. We'll be right with you. Um, right, Don. Uh, Melissa, do you oh. want to go first? And Don, do you, you mind waiting? Yeah, go ahead. Let Melissa go. That's all right. Okay. Go ahead, Melissa. Since you've already tried to get me. Anyway, I there's one thing that has bothered me. I drive up to Point Arena fairly frequently, and there are trees right below the, the power line right of way, right in the power line right of way right below the line that have been hacked at to the point that they're so ugly I can't help but wonder why not just cut them down and stop having to hack at them and it would it would definitely improve the aesthetics of the view understood thanks for the question Melissa um, I'm, I'm honestly not familiar with this area or if it's being encompassed by this um, vegetation management project um, if it is, uh, I, I do think those trees will be removed. Um, there's some that, if, that look like goalposts. And they should be straight. Gotcha. Okay. Understood. Um, so in, in the case that it's kind of outside this project scope, I know that our routine team goes and um, they trim and remove trees in a way that is mitigating the um, clearances and hazards that are within that 12 um, foot in diameter radial clearance. Um, and sometimes it will leave trees like that that might not look um, presentable. Um, and then oftentimes we, we might leave those trees unless we feel that they're um, going to die from the, the type of work that we're conducting, whether it's an extensive trim or um, like a 50% removal. Um, and so that's kind of determined that way. Um, and you said what area was this, Melissa? I could look more into this location. Wallala and Point Arena. There are there are several places where there are some hideously ugly trees that it would look better if it were just cut down. Melissa, I believe you're talking about Highway 1, and that is not where the power line is in this case. Ah, my, my mistake. Oh, and a clarification, I'm very glad... To hear that um, you do stump dressage of the herbicide because that is the only way to use it because it, that it, that avoids that avoids getting drops in the air 
if, and and I'm hoping that you do not do. It sounds like you're saying you don't spray foliage, just dribble stumps. Is this true? That is correct. Oh, that is the only, and I am hate, hate, hating on the use of herbicides, but that is the only use for herbicides by by someone who's trained in how to use them. And then, and I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, of course. And then, Melissa, I just want to provide one clarification. Um, it sounds like the trees that you um, you notice that aren't very presentable are located maybe along Highway One. And sometimes when we work with Caltrans, yeah. they actually request that we leave some of the trees intact sometimes because if we remove some trees, it, it creates a safety hazard. Um, so oftentimes when we are presenting them with a scope um, and they want us to change that prescription, um, we will if it if it would be, you know, half removal of the tree and it doesn't look very good. So there have been on the other side of things, um, cases where they have asked us to remove trees because they don't look appealing. Um, especially in scenic corridors, which we also have done. Oh, good, because this is a very scenic corridor, and those are some extremely ugly trees. Noted. I will definitely take that back, especially along a scenic corridor. Um, I'll look into that. Thank you, sir. All right, are we ready for Don now? Yeah. Yep, I'm through. Thank you. Sorry, I should have said so. I'm falling asleep. Thanks, Melissa. Don't fall asleep. We need you to vote. Don? Okay. Um, well, as I was starting to say, um, number one, I, I do think this is very important work that needs to get done. Um, needs to get done all over the state. And because uh, some of this work is not done on a timely manner in the past, that has that has created hazards that have led to fires. We all know that. So the work needs to be done. The question is, how is it done? And will it be done in a manner that uh, minimizes any disturbance to uh, habitat uh, and uh, the, the health of the forest uh, through which uh, this right away runs? Um, in reviewing the CDP, I mean, it's very extensive, and uh, I read a fair amount of it, but not all of it. Um, I was impressed with the degree to which uh, details uh, were laid out to uh, address various conditions that are encountered during the work. Uh, for example, if a, a nest for an endangered species is, is uh, uncovered or run into that might be in the way of the project. And a biologist is called, uh, for example, to determine what, what could be done or what should be done to protect uh, that area from any uh, damage. Uh, things like that, um, that really go on page after page. So I, I was impressed with that. I mean, it looks, it looks good, you know, when you read it on paper, everything that pg e is going to do, make sure that things are not disturbed or disrupted too much during this work. I guess my concern is, uh, what are the checks? I mean, who is there to really determine how well uh, these protocols are followed, especially given the comment of uh, one of the women who uh, called in today, uh, who mentioned that she was talking to somebody who was working on one of these crews and they said, well, their last job was at Starbucks. So, you know, that just raises the question, how well trained are the crew members? And bear in mind, uh, at least this is my understanding that, uh, these crews are predominantly contracted by PG&E, so they are not direct uh, PG&E employees. They are contractors hired to do this, this kind of work. So uh, I would like some explanation from uh, Robert, please, of PG&E, of 
how this work is monitored to ensure that those very detailed protocols that are laid out in the CDP are actually followed? Great question, Don. Um, so to tackle the, the first question about um, our inspectors, um, the ones I've seen on projects are always certified um, foresters, and they're the ones that are out there doing the inspections of the trees, determining if they're hazards, um, finding out what species height DVH they are, and then ultimately submitting that back to my team for approval. In these sensitive areas where there are biological and cultural resource aspects, um, they are submitted directly to my team. We have a little army of archaeologists and biologists that come together, review these packages, and we'll provide them with an environmental release, which has protocols that they must follow. Um, in those areas that are, that are sensitive, we will oftentimes prescribe um, a biological monitor, an archaeological monitor um, to accompany crews to make sure that we're in compliance and protecting those resources. Um, I know sometimes it's not always feasible for us to, to provide a monitor at every single um, location, but we do have um, um, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service permit. Um, for the multi-region HCP and crews are required to go through annual trainings um, that talk about our, our nest review process, what to do if they encounter a cultural resource, if they encounter an endangered species or just any species, um, they're given instructions on what to, to do. And as an example for that, if we do have an inspector that goes out in the field or a crew member that is getting ready to perform work and they find a nest, um, they are required to send it to our biological team. We have a mailbox specifically for the purpose of sending photographs, um, a Latin long, the tree species, and other detailed information, which sends it right to a biologist. They review um, the nest, um, the photos, and they will send out a person to inspect it um, to determine if the nest is active, inactive, and then they will release that unit back to the tree. Um, in the meantime, we will place buffers on that tree to make sure that crews are not working um, units within that radius, um, depending on what species we think it is, whether it's a raptor or um, things like that nature. But we do have protocols in place, some trainings in place for the crews to follow. Um, and if they do run into something, they are instructed to call us immediately. And where those locations are sensitive, then we will have a monitor on site we oftentimes will do surveys before crews arrive um, just to make sure that they're avoiding any resources that are out there. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, for the most part. Um, so basically these monitors uh, are, are they pg &E employees themselves or are they contractors as well? Uh, they are contractors as well. Oh, they are. Okay. Um, I know, for example, we've used um, a lot of different uh, contract companies from Environmental Resource Management or ERM to Stantec um, and a bunch of other firms depending on the regions that we're in. Okay, but they are engaged by PG&E, not, not, not any other type of independent third party, for example. The other Correct. question I have is, you know, does the CPUC get involved in this at all in terms of monitoring the work you're doing? Yeah, um, absolutely. It's another good question. Uh, we do have uh, federal monitors that will pick and choose um, locations, projects, um, and they will arrange a meeting to go over the scope and watch crews perform it. Um, it's very, um, I don't want to say random, but they they do have uh, federal monitors that go out there and they do watch pg &E perform work at certain projects and locations. What about the county? Does the county get involved at all in this or not? Um, the county typically um, will get involved if there's an encroachment permit, if work is happening along a franchise or a, um, a public right of way um, and a permit's needed. Um, I know a lot of times some inspectors will, will come out there and take a look at projects. And then, of course, whenever um, we're located within the coastal zone, um, we always engage the county um, to determine um, the requirements for a CDP or a coastal development permit or anything to that extent. But um, I think that's the extent we work with the county. Okay, and on another matter, uh, you say that you would use the herbicides on uh, tree trunks um, or stumps, you know, from trees that you cut because you cut the tree because they're determined to be a potential hazard, but only on stumps that 
have a potential to grow back quickly. So are we talking about uh, redwood trees here and perhaps uh, eucalyptus? I mean, what are the species that you would apply this herbicide to? Right, I could get a list um, of species um, to this council um, to review. Um, I don't believe that redwoods are on the list. I could be wrong. Eucalyptus are definitely on the list um, for herbicide use because they are probably one of the fastest growing species. But um, I don't have the list off the top of my head, but I could definitely provide um, those species that we do apply herbicide. Okay, well, I for one am, am rather in favor of herbicide use on eucalyptus since it's non-native tree and it basically kills everything that tries to grow underneath it. But uh, some of the other trees, I, you know, I may not be in favor of that, but I understand your protocol. Um, I think that's all I have uh, for questions, Tom. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Villasenor, I have to compliment you. You've had taken a lot of questions that uh, you might not have expected, although they're probably pretty routine. Um, Joni, I see you have your hand raised, but I, I can't call on you at this point. Um, I, I will in a minute, though. Um, if you chat, send me, oh, you're not on chat on that computer. Um, okay, before I get started, I'll call on Joni. Um, we are free to call on witnesses. Uh, Joni, did you have something to add to this discussion? Yes, this is Brian Flynn. I'm with Joni. And, and uh, oh, two very, very quick things. Um, I had worked extensively in the past with pg and &E on certain other projects within Northern California. And uh, so the first point is, Robert, I thought you were very articulate in your, uh, uh, in your answers and certainly in, in some of the things that you will uh, follow up on. The other is, is there a local nearby or a program or project manager for the uh, vegetation management that is a direct hire with pg and &E that would be available to answer specific questions at any particular given time, depending on location along the areas that we're discussing for either the council or for other property owners. Absolutely. That, that's it. Absolutely. There is a single point person um, or a couple people. Um, I have their supervisor's contact information. So if it's all right with this council, I will reach out to this gentleman um, and get a point of contact so that we have a person that is able to answer directly um, the questions that come up with this project, including the vegetation management, um, scope of work um, that I was not probably able to provide clarification. Um, so I will make it a note. I hope it's okay that I send that directly to you, Tom, and then uh, maybe you can disperse that to the council. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'm gonna go on with my questions now. If anybody, anybody else wants to ask a question, you can signal me somehow. Um, and I will um, get that information from Mr. Villasenor and pass it along uh, on, through the Facebook group to other people in the community as well, as well as putting it in the um, GMAC record. So I had a number of questions um, and I wanna emphasize something I said earlier and Don had mentioned this too, is this is critical work. We're in a bad fire season, um, you don't have to, be real smart about this um, to know that we need some tree trimming done and uh, the state regulations, federal regulations require it. Um, we do need some of this work done. Um, but I, I think at the same time, I, I'm so concerned about this that I'm worried about creating new hazards, new safety hazards, both for fire, pesticides, water supplies. Uh, we have a critical drought going on. Uh, we have uh, a lot of endangered species around here. Um, I do worry about animals feeding on in the areas where the pesticides and herbicides are used. Um, so my first question is, um, the Paradise Fire began when uh, a coupling broke off. I think it was a, a 127,000 volt line up in um, up the mountains. Um, the cable broke, it fell onto brush beneath the power poles, ignited it, and boom, the town of Paradise was gone along with hundreds of thousands of acres. 
Um, so I'm concerned about the use, the allowance for an average of 18 inches of debris uh, fallen under the power lines, cut from the trees and left under the power lines, uh, where they, this is evergreen stuff. It's gonna dry out, it's gonna become very brittle. Uh, it would be ideal kindling for a fire. Um, and so, as I understand it, the plan is to leave, to conform with the PUC guidelines to leave that debris underneath up to an average depth of 18 inches. Is that correct, Mr. Villasenor? Um, thank you so much for bringing this question. I, I think this kind of came up earlier and I neglected to answer it. So wherever we are doing lop and scatter and or um, uh, wood chip piling, um, there, it will definitely not be underneath any transmission lines. Um, that is a fire hazard. If there is a spark, that can ignite. And so wherever that lop and scatter and those chips, um, any logs that are um, being left on site, it cannot and will not be directly underneath the power lines. Um, not only is it a fire hazard, but it also creates a tripping hazard for any emergency tree crew or emergency electric transmission uh, linemen that have to come out to repair these facilities. Um, it would be a burden for them to have to remove these um, items in order for them to access these um, transmission lines and transmission poles um, and towers. And so as part of not only the fire hazard, we make sure to leave these um, lines and access routes clear from any kind of debris or lop and scatter or chip material that could pose a tripping hazard for those crews. But we definitely do not allow um, those uh, debris to be placed under the line where they can cause ignition. How wide is the right of way? So the right of way, um, it differs depending on the area. I know um, towards the southern end of the project, uh, it looks like the, the line is within a, um, the public corridor. And then as it moves north, it looks like the right of way can extend. Um, we oftentimes have easements that are 200 feet for a 60 kV line. I think it's um, probably more in the 100 feet realm. And so I think it kind of changes based on the location as you move up north um, of the project. And I'd have to go through each easement and, and verify which parcels have um, that specific right of way width. And I'm just guessing here, but the, the distance between your poles is a couple of hundred feet, isn't it? Uh, that's correct. I think when I looked it up, um, it looked like it was about um, 50 feet for, um, for example, the um, 60 kilovolt lines. If it uh, is more than 60 kV, um, then the distance between those will most likely increase. But for the purpose of this project, um, it is a 60 kV line. Yeah, I, I went up and looked at these lines yesterday, and I can tell you that it's more than 60 feet. Uh, in fact, I will share a slide. You, you, you won't be able to see this, but I'm going to share a slide here to show a piece of old stage road uh, where the first pole isn't even in the foreground, and it's just a long way to the next pole. I'm guessing it's uh, well over 100 feet. Oh, I see. I'm, I'm sorry. So the spans, um, the spans between each pole, uh, they definitely differ. Um, and I know those are um, engineered from our, our engineers here at pg &E. um, they, they calculate the distance, um, how much the pole can hold, as well as the, the sway of the, the lines. So um, depending on the length of the span, the lines will sag, right? And then um, depending on the weather, whether it's hot or cold, the lines may sag more because with the increase or decrease of temperature, the actual electric conductors will um, expand um, and therefore sag more. So they have to take that into consideration and then also take into consideration any wind events that happen. Um, so they are carefully um, articulate each set of poles um, that will be placed to make sure that we are within the um, CPUC compliance and regulations um, of those conductor loads to make sure that we're um, adequately holding with those wind and those sag events. So this brings me back to my debris question. If the right of way is um, up to 100 feet wide and narrower in parts, and they're not leaving the debris directly under the wires, but on the side perhaps of the right of way, 
uh, couldn't those cables snap and still set off that debris, especially in a high wind? Uh, if it wind's strong enough to rip those cables, I'm guessing it's strong enough for them to whip around and hit everything within the range of that cable, which could be 50, 60 feet. That's that's correct. Um, I, I know they take into consideration, um, the engineers take into consideration the right of way for those um, electric lines. Um, the vegetation management folks just make sure that the those debris are not located under the lines. They might be placed on the side um, where in the events that there is a break in the line, um, those are, are hopefully placed in, in a safe manner. Um, but I know those transmission towers are, are pretty tall and it would probably require us to off haul everything um, to make sure that we're inside of that compliance, um, those compliances. Well, the, the requirements allow you to leave up to 18 inches there on average. They could be three feet in one area and zero in another. Um, so I hope you'd go beyond the compliance there. Um, Understood. The, the next question I have is uh, regarding opt-out rights for pesticides and tree cutting. Um, I, I personally am not satisfied with the notion that somebody's got to go and read the 240 page application to find out what's in this plan uh, and get a letter that they may not know that their trees have already been marked to be re re taken away. Um, that PG&E may be considering an expansion of the easement. Um, and I'm going to, um, I, I'm wondering if, if you plan to go to each property owner, I know that's hundreds of property owners along the course of this line, uh, and ask those questions. Are, are you willing to go along with this and get some written permission for those things? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think what I can do is I'll talk to our, our customer representatives. I know they do send out letters. Um, I think it, I, I'm not sure if they're in planning to do outreach to every single individual, um, but we can definitely have um, a more broader conversation with folks to let them know about this transmission um, clearing project. Um, and then as part of that, um, I forgot I was going to say, um, so I can touch base with them to make sure that just the awareness is, is out there and to make sure that we are communicating that to um, folks out in the vicinity. Um, and then in, in regards to the, um, the expansion of the right of way, um, I know that if they are planning to extend the right of way from a, a like a, um, a land survey or like a meets and bounds area to expand from maybe let's say 60 to 80 feet, then that has to be um, formally documented in the form of an easement. Um, if they're they're saying that the widening of the right of way is for the vegetation management, um, it still is within that easement um, boundary limits unless there's that vegetation clause that allows us to um, move outside of that um, easement right away with. Um, and then if that's the case, again, these property owners should be told that we're doing vegetation management work within their property. Okay. But because but because of we have an easement, um, I know we would most likely consult with the property owners um, and, and get their opinions and um, work with them to do what they want. <laughs> but I think getting written approval um, most likely maybe wouldn't happen because we do have the right to maintain vegetation within the right of way but we would definitely be willing to work with them um, and their concerns about herbicide usage as well as expanding um, right of ways. Okay, I, I have one more question, or one or two more questions for you, uh, and then I'll move on. Um, pesticides and surface water, a lot of the property owners along the path of this use well water or even spring water on their land. Uh, Spraying pesticides or herbicides onto tree stumps is fine until it rains, it runs into a gully, it runs down into the surface water. Uh, I, I'm not really satisfied with the explanations I've heard here. And I, I did hear questions about the opt-out uh, option on pesticides. Uh, can people opt out of having pesticides on their property? Uh, that's, that's a good question, Tom. Um, that would have to be a question for our vegetation management partners. I'm, I'm honestly not sure about an opt-out. I'm, um, 
I, I can't accurately answer that question, unfortunately. Okay. That, and your vegetation management partners are the contractors who'd be applying the pesticides. Is that correct? Correct. Um, cause I'm with the environmental side. Um, and I'd have to loop them in, um, to find out what their procedures are with the property owners for herbicide application. All right. Big question here. Um, when's all this work going to take place? Uh, you know, I think, I think Mrs. Shannon, uh, was speaking earlier. She, she was surprised to see her trees marked. Um, and, um, I think a lot of people would be, or were surprised to hear this project's even planned. Um, when, when is this all going to be happening along this 28 mile stretch? Uh, good question. We um, identified this scope um, in 2019 towards um, the end of 2019. Um, we started preparing um, from an environmental perspective uh, later in 2020 and um, we are putting together this application. And I know there are a lot of agencies that were working with um, Caltrans as well as um, Mendocino's local coastal program um, to issue a CDP. And then I think once that CDP is issued, um, it would likely be maybe 30 days um, in order for us to get all our environmental ducks in a row, um, to do any surveys that are necessary, um, and then to have an environmental training with the crews before they um, start working out here. Um, so I, I think once the, this, the coastal development permit is issued, it would probably be at least 30 days um, from that period that we would start working in this area. Any and I know when that would be coming before the, uh, the commission on that. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. I know that we were planning to hopefully start um, doing this vegetation work um, in late October. Um, so if the Mendocino local coastal program does approve this permit, uh, for us, we would most likely try to target um, the end of October, since this is a, um, a we call it a wildfire um, tier two area, which is a high fire threat area. Okay, and uh, one other question, uh, Mr. Evans raised the question about use of chainsaws and the hours they'd be used. Uh, everybody around here has been encouraged not to use chainsaws in afternoon because of the high winds that pick up in the afternoon. Um, has that been considered a factor in this project? So um, another good question. We have, um, in the events that there, there's a, a very strong um, weather event where there's going to be um, a lot of heat, we oftentimes will have crews stand down. They're not allowed to use chainsaws or mechanical equipment that could ignite a fire. Um, and that's the same case mm. for maybe a strong wind event that would happen with an intense heat. Um, they would they would have to stand down with use of chainsaws and only use hand tools that are not um, gas powered. Um, and so in events like that, we would definitely not have them use gas powered equipment. Um, and then once those weather activities go back to normal, they would resume the use of chainsaws and things of that nature. Well, let me let me just say, <clears throat> and anybody on this call that disagrees could could let you know, <clears throat> but that's pretty much a daily event here. Uh, we get strong north and northwest winds almost every afternoon, unless the wind happens to be blowing from the other direction. Um, a major wind event, um, I don't know, I, I think 20 to 40 mile per hour winds in the afternoons uh, up on the ridge uh, would be a hazard. So I, I would just clue you in on that. Uh, it's something that people here will be thinking about since we're not we're not allowed to use a weed whacker afternoon around here. Um, Understood. I think that uh, concludes my questions for you, sir. But I do have a question if with Jenny, Jenny Shattuck, if she's still with us. I'm here. Jenny, do you Can have you any me? comments? Yes, I do hear you. Um, and I, I just wanted to give you a chance uh, to comment on any aspect of this, pesticides, right-of-ways, fire dangers. And I, I also want, would appreciate if you just say in a sentence or two, uh, it's my understanding your family has been around this area for a hundred years and that you're involved in the logging industry. Is that correct? Yeah, so we actually own a logging company. So it's kind of funny when the subcontractors called us uh, tree-hugging liberals that hated uh, killing trees. So that was kind of funny. But um, yeah, I actually have more questions 
after hearing um, what was said about the um, vegetation management um, answers, I'm, I'm going to ask you to just comment ask. on what, what you've heard here, Jenny, just in the, in the sake of brevity. Uh, if you could just, okay. did you, did you um, hear, are you satisfied with these explanations? Are you satisfied with the answers? Was there something we skipped over that we need to talk about? Um, I wouldn't, I, I don't know how to put this. I'm wondering if the vegetation management and the environmental review is different for down there than it is along the 60 KVs coming over Highway 20, because the sprayers on Highway 20 use back pumps and they literally spray from one end of the easement with their sprayers to the other. And in those photos that you had posted, I can't see them right now, looking down the power lines, it is completely dead. And it's been that way since 2016 when they sprayed that property after they were told they couldn't. Um, nothing's grown back, but some scotch broom and pompous grass, which were never there before. It was just huckleberries, ferns, and irises. Um, so they do spray, it seems to be amazapur, garlon 3A, and glyphosate mixed together in tanks. And that's what they've done across the entire 60 KV on Highway 20. So I'm wondering if they have a different practice for this section. Mr. That, would be my that, that, does, that, that would be your barrier, area, Mr. Villasenor. Did I hear her say that you use glyphosate in this? Uh, I believe um, the herbicide they use is, yeah, they mixture with Garlon 3 and then um, they do mix herbicides. Um, I have to dig into that situation there that um, I honestly am not familiar with that project, but I, I'd have to touch base with the team to find out um, what exactly happened in 2016 in that area. All right. Well, Thank you very much. This is also currently... It's also happening currently across the 60 KVs today and all week and all year with that mixture being sprayed with hand sprayers, not drips. Okay, Understood. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Shattuck, for that information. Um, yeah, I was going to ask Robert, you have a question, and then we can go around the council one more time before we uh, conclude yeah. our questions. Uh, Tom, thanks. I just wanted to ask Robert um, how willing pg &E is to work with the individual property owners. Um, I wanted, you know, from a certain perspective here that I'm, I'm going to get at in a second here. Um, GMAC, our, our council is primarily um, responsible or giving advice and recommendations on our jurisdictional area, which is um, from 10 mile cutoff and Iverson intersection there on to south to um, the substation and to the Wallala River where it goes into Sonoma County. So um, as I said earlier, I'm familiar with a lot of the properties, especially south of uh, the 10 mile uh, Iverson Road intersection there. And um, there's a, a swath uh, that goes through the back of some of these properties along Iverson. And I, I've known of people who do a lot of their own maintenance. That's their property actually underneath those lines. And um, if they maintain that property where the easement goes over the aerial easement of pg &E's. is that something you encourage or will you work with the property owners for them to do their own maintenance so that they can maybe avoid herbicides and pesticides on their property? Robert, that's a good question. I know that pg &E is mandated to uh, make sure that these components are, are cleared um, so that we're not, our, the units aren't encroaching onto our conductors. Um, I do have a feeling that if there yeah. are vegetation management activities happening um, from private property owners, our crews will definitely work with them. Um, if they're, they're being dealt with and they're not hazardous um, to our lines, then, you know, that's, that's very, that's very good. Um, so I, I do guarantee that our, our vegetation management folks that are out there in the field um, would work with private property owners in that respect. Okay. And I know some of property owners who have been doing this on their own, just, um, on their own volition that they've been um, where they know that they're the easement is described on their deeds they've been uh, keeping that uh, property intact or the vegetation down very low because they are aware of the easement when they purchase this property so uh, I just want to see how willing PG&E is to work with the individual property owners on doing some of that 
maintenance themselves and to avoid um, the pesticides and herbicide issue. Of course, we do have veg management folks that um, would be willing to meet with private property owners out there to discuss the scope of work at um, those particular properties. And if there's lesser vegetation, then there, there should be um, lesser to no work identified there. Good. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you. Melissa, if you're still with us, do you have another question? Anything else? No, nope, I asked everything I was curious about. Okay. Kevin? Uh, I have a couple of follow-up questions for Robert. One, are your crews going to have a certified arborist on staff? Yep, Kevin, that's a good question. Um, there is a lead arborist that is designated to each crew. Um, they they have to be on site with them um, to monitor the work and answer any questions that come up um, when the vegetation work is underway. Okay, and when you, uh, so they will determine the health of a tree and how much will be cut, correct? Correct, um, typically that's already done um, when we, we go through um, the inspector process, which they put together a package of trees um, that are put together for, for work orders. And so at that point, they determine the health of the tree, um, the species, the height, the DBH, how much should be trimmed to maintain the compliance, um, and then release that unit to the crew to perform that work to ensure that it is um, in good health when we leave it. Okay. Um... Is the health of a tree compromised when you top it? Um, I, I honestly would not be able to answer that question. Um, I'd have to have a PG and &E arborist um, on the line to, to kind of help facilitate that question. Um, I do know that we do top trees um, and they don't die, um, but there might be instances where maybe a tree is topped and it, it doesn't um, maybe survive depending on the scope of work and how close it is in proximity to conductors, but I would just be speculating. Okay, well, and if a if a healthy tree is topped and it does die, is PG responsible for the removal of that dead tree? So we would most likely remove it because at that point it could potentially become a hazard to our facilities, whether it falls into the conductor or if there's a pole or tower nearby that it could fall into and cause a hazard to our facilities. Okay, and one last question. Uh, is stump grinding out of, out of the question, is that cost prohibitive? Um, I do not believe we do stump grinding because I, I believe that would be a ground disturbing activity which is typically not uh, permitted under um, the environmental restrictions we place along the cruise. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Don, do you wanna have any other questions? Yeah, just so one last question. Um, this has to do with sort of the a global look of our uh, region and its fire risk in terms of these transmission lines in the forests that they uh, traverse. Um, what is the time frame for this type of work, this vegetation management work, for the other uh, high voltage transmission line that comes into Wallala from the south. That obviously passes mostly through Sonoma County, but once it crosses the Gualala River, then it's in Mendocino County. And um, again, this is, is a heavily forested area. So I'm just curious what the time frame is for vegetation management work on that portion of your transmission system? That is another great question. Um, I'm looking through my database now to determine if we currently have a project um, scheduled. I know sometimes we have a um, designated projects that we, we kind of foresee with this type of right of way clearing um, that will occur. Um, and there's probably a handful of projects that happen every year. Um, and this one just happens to be in Mendocino County, whereas maybe down the road we'll We'll have a project in Sonoma County. Um, I don't think that Brittany or I have any projects identified in Sonoma County this year, but there is a possibility that they might determine this maybe the same line um, will undergo um, a similar project um, in 2022 or 2023 or 2024. 
Do you know offhand, perhaps you don't, but uh, the actual status of that line and how close it is to actually needing vegetation management? It's a great does question. PG&E, does pg and &E keep a database of all their lines and the forests that they run through and the actual status? What, for example, when was the last time vegetation management occurred? When is it scheduled? When should it occur again? I, I presume pg and &E does that. That's correct. We, we do annual inspections. Uh, so every year we send out a, um, an inspector to look at the vegetation, see if it's getting close to um, the conductors, if you know another year would hold. And then if we don't think that vegetation will hold within that year, um, then they will flag it to be worked, whether it's you know a trim or something to that effect. But there are annual patrols. Um, we do also use LIDAR detection, um, which is you know from the aerial that goes down and determines um, what risk those trees are to our, our assets, which you know happens occasionally. But um, there definitely is routine inspections. And while this project maybe have been identified in late 2019, those annual inspections did still occur and routine maintenance was done. Um, even this year, um, early this year, if we do an inspection and find that there's vegetation units that are approaching the conductors, then we will perform that work, even with this work identified for safety. Okay, so what you're saying is if you, uh, through these spot checks or whatever that occur, uh, if you notice something, some tree that's getting dangerously close to the lines, on an ad hoc basis, you will go out and trim that tree. Uh, Absolutely. True, okay. Well, I mean, that's great. That sounds great, but obviously that hasn't worked out all that well in the past uh, because a number of the fires that this state has suffered through and some of them extremely destructive uh, have occurred because some of these uh, trees were not trimmed in a timely manner. That is a good point. I, I do know that sometimes um, the fires, the wildfires that occurred um, due to PG&E um, either occurred via equipment faultation or um, recently there may have been a tree that had fallen into the line. Um, I, I don't believe that there was, if in that case there was a a trimming um, error that took place, but um, more of a, a tree falling into the line, creating ignition. Okay, well, thank you, Robert, for your information. I just have a couple more questions, um, wrap this up. Um, redwood has become very valuable and some of these other trees could be valuable as well. Uh, if a tree is taken, um, who gets the tree? Does it stay on the property? Does the property owner have it? Does the contractor, if the contractor removes it, is it their property? Do they sell it? Does PG&E profit from it? How does that work? Another great question. So um, the tree, if a redwood tree is removed, it becomes the property of the property owner that is, you know, sometimes merchantable wood and so we would leave that for the property owner um, to, to do as they wish. Um, pg e is by no means a timber harvest company. Um, we do not profit from the wood and debris that we remove um, for, for our lines. Um, if we do that, then we kind of get under new regulations. And so we're just in the business of um, electricity and gas. And so as part of that, we, we don't um, sell or hold on to, to timber or lumber for sales purposes. And what about the contractors? Uh, they should definitely not be um, keeping or selling the wood either. Okay, I, I hear should, but I'm not hearing they don't. Right. Well, they they I would I want to say that they 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 don't. You're right. They they don't. They should not be um, keeping the wood as stewards of PG&E. That um, shouldn't happen. Again, I don't. I don't work with the vegetation management folks, um, but I'd have to get them on here to, to say for certain that doesn't happen. Um, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is that our stance is that contractors aren't going to take that wood and sell it. That is not um, something that PG&E would allow. Okay, I, I hope not. Um, 
obviously that would create a perverse incentive, as it's known. A uh, perverse incentive is when there's a bad reason to do something that may not be readily apparent, um, such as taking more trees than are necessary. And I'm thinking back to Ms. Ms. Shattuck's uh, hillside full of uh, redwood trees that were all marked for cutting down until she insisted on meeting with the company representatives. Um, this, this line and this project do go, as Robert said earlier, go well beyond our, our territory for GMAC. Uh, we go up to Iverson Road, and this goes probably three times as far, maybe four. And, uh, but this is something that I think the county would want us to explore in its full length. It's one single project that's been referred to us for review, and I do feel it falls within our jurisdiction for that reason, um, wholly. And even if it doesn't, certainly the testimony we've heard tonight from a lot of these folks, including Ms. Shattuck or Fort Bragg, uh, do factor into our decisions tonight. And I'm, I'm very grateful that we had a good public turnout on this tonight. There's a lot of really good questions. And, and thank you, Mr. Villasenor, for fielding them so well and for being so cordial with us. Um, we've had some acrimonious hearings at this council in the past, and this has been a very civil one, I would say. Um, I think we've gone through the entire council. Mary, uh, since it's your first meeting back, I'll, I'll recognize you uh, if you want to have a say here briefly. I just, wanted, I just wanted to answer one question, and that is when I spoke to a planner today, he said that any owner along the line on which uh, these trees will be cut can definitely sign on not, uh, an opt option, opt out option on spraying as well as cutting. And they need to be notified regarding the cutting and the spraying. Uh, and uh, that's uh, kind of uh, 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 worrying to me that they will be notified in time because um, uh, there is a, an ordinance uh, that the county has about opt out on cutting and spraying. So um, I just wanted to answer that question because of. Uh, 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 Mayor, the uh, representative didn't know. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Uh, I was going to mention that, but yes, it, that's absolutely true. And uh, if PG&E isn't reaching out to all the property owners, it probably needs to, uh, mm -hmm. each one of them. And they are all listed in the application, so they know who they are. Good. Um, all all right. I'm going to, uh, unless there's any other questions from the council members, I'm, I'm going to see if we're ready to move to a um, discussion of a motion. I have a, a draft. I've been working on some notes I could share with the council. Shall I do that? Please do, Tom. Yeah. We spent, okay. Let me see. Clubs on this. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've gone over time. We might want to take a brief break after we finally finish this, but um, let me share my screen one more time. I have notes here, a draft motion that should work, I think. Let me get my list of attendees off here. Okay, are you seeing the draft motion? Yes. Okay, I'll read through this slowly. Uh, I think this covers most of what we heard tonight. And we can talk about any of these clauses individually as a council. Uh, the public session is now closed. The testimony is now closed. Uh, in full accord with state and federal regulations, the Walla Municipal Advisory Council recommends approval of CDP 2021-0034 for PG&E to engage in vegetation management to reduce fire danger along the 60 kilovolt lines from Elk to Walla subject to the following conditions on the utility and its contractors. One, any tree trimming or removal more than 12 feet from the line or facilities and or outside the utilities right away requires written approval in advance by the property owner. Two, the use of any herbicide or pesticide outside the right of way will require written approval in advance by the property owner and public notice on site of the use. Three, PG&E will refrain from the use of any herbicides or pesticides listed by the state of California and or the county of Mendocino as known or suspected agents of cancer, birth defects, harm to wildlife, including but not limited to, to pesticides containing glyphosate, 
or chlorpyrifos. Four, all foliage and slash resulting from the work will be removed from the right of way to reduce fire danger. And five, any financial proceeds received from the timber cut during this work shall be placed in a county fund to assist wildlife victims. And I know Mr. Villasenor just said they don't expect any, but that's kind of a just in case. And uh, I put it to assist fi wildlife fi wildfire victims because I don't want the county, the property owners, or the company or its contractor to um, uh, think about that might be a good idea. We, we just basically want it to go to a good cause. So um, I would like to make this motion. And if there's a second, we can open it for discussion. I'll second um, the motion. I'll, oh, OK. OK, we have a second from Don. OK. And we can open it up for further discussion now. Who would like to comment? I'll start, Tom. Yeah. Um, I'm, I think it's an excellent motion. I'm very satisfied with the first two points, which were going to be things that I brought up in the event we didn't have a draft motion yet. And, and I like the other three points also. Um, if there was some way we, we could work out something with the property owner working with PG&E on going outside of the right of way, that that would be a possibility, but I am fine. I like the motion, um, especially number one and two. Okay, do any of the council members on number two, I have to use it for herbicide pesticide outside the right of way will require written approval. Should that also be, should we take out the outside the right of way and just say the use of any herbicide or pesticide on private property will require yeah, written I would, approval. I would, yeah, I would feel more comfortable with that, that any use of herbicide and pesticides, the property owners should be notified and so, the public notice as well. Yeah, so instead of outside, what about within, Tom? Um, within what? Within the right-of-way. Right yeah. Well, I'm thinking about what might happen outside the right-of-way, but let's try that. New keyboard, so please bear with me. Yeah, Use of any would... herbicide pesticide within the right of way will require uh, written approval in advance by the property owner and public notice on site of the use. I think that's good. Tom, should should we put a time frame on that as well? Should it be 48 hours, 72 hours? Uh, because we don't want to have it a 24 hour notice. So we, we want to give them ample notification. Okay, uh, what do you think, Kevin? Public notice on site of the use uh, at least 24 hours or at least 48 hours uh, prior to application? I would say 48 or 72, whatever the, uh, the board uh, thinks would be appropriate, but yeah, the more the better. Okay, I'll go with 72. Does somebody feel strongly about something else? I think 72 is sufficient. Okay. Um, I think that uh, pretty much does it. Anybody else have any comments on this? Uh, Tom, yeah, I, I think uh, overall it's pretty good. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. whether the changes we made to number two sort of imply that, well, only herbicide pesticide treatment within the right of way is covered and outside the right of way, we don't say anything. Even though te technically outside the right of way uh, is, is private property. Right. I, I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we need to say anything there. I mean, we just take out anything about the right of way. Just say use of any herbicide pesticide will require written approval in advance by the property owner. That covers both right away and outside the right away. That's a good point, Don. Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. Mm -hmm. The use of herbicide pesticide will require written, or I'll say the planned use. All right. 
Yeah. Anything I else? Think, I think that's good. All right. Are there any other changes that people would like to suggest? I see a chat message coming in. Let me see if we got something else. Okay, I think we're good. Um, okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, do we need a new motion since we amended this a little? I guess we do. I'll withdraw my initial motion and um, make a new motion to approve um, this recommendation. And uh, do we have a second on that? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, it's Murphy and Hess. And Mr. Young, like I think we're ready for a vote. Okay. Um, Melissa? Bye. Don? Aye. Tom? Aye. Kevin? Aye. And Robert? Aye. Okay, um, I, that concludes our hearing on this matter tonight. I wanna thank everybody who attended and gave evidence uh, or asked questions. I wanna particularly thank Mr. Villasenor for being so patient and staying with us this long. Uh, I was afraid nobody from pg and &E would come tonight. Uh, I notified several people by phone and by email and uh, was very pleased to see him here tonight. So thank you for being here, Mr. Villasenor. Um, I will take responsibility for sending this off to Mr. Villasenor and to the county uh, so that this, can, this action is recorded. And this video, um, we do put these up on our YouTube channel. They can be reviewed there by anybody in the community. And given the length of this hearing tonight, I may break this out as a separate piece and, and publicize this to the community um, at some point. So. Um, I think we're, that concludes this matter. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Robert. Thank you for letting me uh, uh, lead this, this hearing, Robert. Okay, very thorough hearing. Um, and thanks to all of you for the work you've done on this.